Hello and welcome to a discussion on the topic religion and law or correlation. Let me first begin with the Indian concept of secularism. You see, constitutionally, India is a secular country and has no state religion. However, over the years, it has developed its own unique concept of secularism that is fundamentally different from that of the other concepts of other nations. Initially, the preamble of the constitution did not even include the word secular in the short description of the country, which it called a sovereign democratic republic. Despite the clear incorporation of all the basic principles of secularism into the various provisions of the constitution. This was a well calculated decision to avoid any misgiving that India was to adopt any of the western notions of a secular state. 25 years later, the preamble to the constitution was amended by the 42nd Amendment Act 1976 to include the word secular along with socialist to declare India to be a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. So, now we are a secular nation, but neither in law nor in practice there exists in this country any wall of separation between religion and the state. The two can and often do interact and intervene in each other's affairs within the legally prescribed and judicially settled parameters. The only demand of secularism as mandated by the Indian constitution is that the state must treat nil religious creeds and their respective adherents absolutely equally and without any discrimination under its direct or indirect control. There were two different occasions on which attempts were made to amend the constitution with a view to further strengthen and clarify its provisions on secularism. But the bills moved in this regard could not be enacted for technical reasons. Among these bills were first 45th amendment bill of 1978 proposing to define the expression secular republic as a republic in which there is equal respect for all religions. Second, 80th Amendment Bill of 1993 seeking to empower Parliament to ban parties and associations if they promote religious disharmony and disqualify members who indulge in such misconduct. Talking about equality and non-discrimination, see you must be knowing that the constitution of India contains in its chapter on fundamental rights several provisions that emphasize complete legal equality of its citizens irrespective of their religion and creed and prohibit any kind of religion based discrimination. Among these provisions are first the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. Second, the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth or any of them either in general or in the matter of access to or use of general and public places and conveniences. Third, there shall be equality of opportunity for all citizens in the matter of employment or appointments under the state and no citizen shall on grounds only of religion be ineligible for or discriminated against in respect of any employment or office under the state. Fourth, the traditional religious concept and practice of untouchability stands 
abolished in any form and is strictly forbidden. And fifth, if the state imposes compulsory service on citizens for public purposes, no discrimination shall be made in this regard on the ground of religion only. You see, religious freedom as an individual's right is guaranteed by the constitution to all persons within certain parameters. First, all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right freely to profess, practice and propagate religion. Second, there shall be freedom as to payment of taxes for promotion of any particular religion by virtue of which no person shall be compelled to pay any taxes the proceeds of which are specifically appropriated in payment of expenses for the promotion or maintenance of any particular religious denomination. Third, no religious instruction is to be provided in the schools wholly maintained by state funding and those attending any state recognized or state aided school cannot be required to take part in any religious instruction or services without their consent. Now moving on to group rights, freedom of religion is guaranteed by the constitution of India as a group right too in many ways. First, every religious denomination or any section thereof has the right to manage its religious affairs, establish and maintain institutions for religious and charitable purposes and own, acquire and administer properties of all kinds. Second, any section of the citizens having a distinct language, script or culture of its own shall have the right to conserve the same. And third, religious and linguistic minorities are free to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice, which shall not be discriminated against by the state in the matter of giving aid or compensation in the event of acquisition. You see, the fundamental right to religious freedom cannot be enjoyed in an absolutely unrestricted manner. There are of course limitations, precisely lawful restrictions within which these rights can be exercised. First, the right to freedom of religion is in general subject to public order, morality, health and the other provisions of the constitution. Second, despite the right to religious freedom, the state can pass laws providing for social welfare and reform and also to regulate or restrict any secular activity, be it economic, financial and political etc even though it may be traditionally associated with religion. And third, despite the minority's right to establish and maintain educational institutions, no citizen can be kept away from any state aided or state maintained educational institution only on religious grounds. You may note that the state can by way of positive discrimination and affirmative action make special provisions in certain cases and these will not be deemed to be detracting from the provisions relating to the rights of equality and non-discrimination in general. First, despite the right to equality, the state can provide special measure for women and children and for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward class of citizens or for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Second, despite the right to equality, the state can reserve appointments or posts for any backward class of citizens not adequately represented in state services. Third, 
Despite the right to equality, a law may require that the incumbent of a religious or denominational office or member of such a committee must be a person of the concerned religion. And fourth, despite the right to equality in terms of a directive principle of state policy, the state shall promote with special care the economic and educational interest of the weaker sections of the people, including but not exclusively the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and shall protect them from social injustice and exploitation. Besides fundamental rights, there is also the chapter on fundamental duties inserted into the constitution by the 42nd amendment act of 1976 which includes such basic national obligations of all the citizens as promoting harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood amongst all the people of India transcending religious, linguistic and regional or sectional diversities and valuing and preserving the rich heritage of our composite culture. Under article 246 of the constitution, various religious matters noted fall in the jurisdiction of the state and both parliament and the state legislatures or either of them can legislate on such matters as pilgrimage outside India, pilgrimage within India, burials and burial grounds, cremations and cremation grounds, family relations, succession and all other personal law matters charities, charitable institutions and endowments as well as religious endowments and religious institutions. You see by a dictate of the constitution religion has no role to play in elections to parliament and state assemblies and councils. For all elections to central and state legislatures, the electoral rolls for every constituency shall be general and common and no person can either be excluded from or included in any such role only on the basis of his or her religion. To implement this provision of the constitution, the election law contain the representation of the people act 1951 that incorporates provisions declaring the use of religion during electioneering both as a corrupt practice that will vitiate the election of the winning candidate and also as a punishable offense. There have been numerous cases where the courts have commented upon, explained and interpreted the provisions of the constitution on equality, non-discrimination and religious freedom. The decisions in most of these cases have been given the context of the rights of particular religious communities or laws relating to such communities. To brief on the major decisions, let me first begin with what is religion. Well, the constitution uses but does not define the expressions religion and religious denominations and therefore the courts have found it necessary to explain the meaning and connotation of these words. The Supreme Court has observed that in the background of the provisions of the constitution and the light shed by judicial precedent, we may say that religion is a matter of faith, it is a matter of belief and doctrine. It concerns the conscience that is the spirit of man, it must be capable of expression in word and deed. 
such as worship or ritual. Next, coming to the right to religious freedom, well, interpreting the constitutional provisions relating to freedom of religion, the Supreme Court has observed that the right to religion guaranteed under Articles 25 and 26 is not an absolute or unpatterned right. They are subject to reform on social welfare by appropriate legislation by the state. The court therefore, while interpreting Article 25 and 26 strikes a careful balance between matters which are essential and integral part and those which are not and the need for the state to regulate or control in the interest of the community. Moving on to the educational rights of minorities, well, our constitution has guaranteed certain cherished rights of the minorities concerning their language, culture and religion. So long as the constitution stands as it is and is not altered, it is as we must conceive the duty of this court to uphold the fundamental rights and thereby maintain our sacred obligation to the minority communities who are of our own. Besides the general provisions relating to religious neutrality of the state and religious liberties of the people, we find within the constitution of India a number of religion based and religion related provisions for certain communities who can be classified as first the Hindus, Buddhists, Jains and Sikhs who are mentioned in the constitution by their denominational names and second certain groups who are mostly Christian by religion, but the special provisions do not mention them as denominational groups. There are also special provisions in the constitution for the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain and Sikh communities. First is declaration of abolition of untouchability and prohibition of its practice in any form. Second is a directive principle of state policy requiring the state to take steps to prohibit slaughter of cows and calves, reverence for whom is customary among the Hindus. Third is declaration of the validity of pre-existing and future laws made to throw open Hindu places of worship to all sects and sections of the Hindus with a supplementary provision giving the power for the Buddhist, Jain and Sikh shrines. Fourth is a special provision for the grant of specified annual maintenance allowances to be given from the state exchequer for the upkeep of Hindu temples of a certain denominations in two South Indian states, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. And fifth is a declaration of wearing and carrying a kirpan or sword, which is a fundamental right for the Sikhs. There are also special provisions in the constitution for certain communities which are mainly Christian by religion. These include first some special provisions of a transitory nature for the Anglo-Indian community. Second, a provision for the protection of the customary law and its administration among the Nagas in the Christian dominated state of Nagaland. And third, a similar provision for the Mizos in the Christian dominated state of Mizoram. Despite its association with the Christian religion, Sunday remains the weekly holiday throughout India. Apart from this, India celebrates only three 
national holidays, Independence Day on 15th August, Republic Day on 26th January and Father of the Nation's birthday called Gandhi Jayanti on 2nd October. Rest of the holidays in this country, the list of which rather long are religious. Birthdays of founders of all religions are observed as republic holidays. So are birthdays of religious figures like Ganesh Hanuman, Guru Gobind Singh, Guru Ravidas, and Rishi Balmiki. Apart from these birthday festivals, there are public holidays throughout India also for some other Hindu, Muslim and Christian festivals including Holi, Dipavali, Dashera, Raksha Bandhan, Idul Fitr, Idul Jaha, Idul Fitr, Idul Aja, Muharram and Good Friday. There has been a tradition in India since long shared by all communities to take out religious processions on public streets. Such processions are specially arranged on most of the religion's festivals, which I just referred to. The law of India approves this right of the religious communities subject to the general laws for maintaining law and order and protecting public mobility. The constitution of India makes several special provisions for the scheduled castes who are to be identified by the government and whose official list may be amended by the parliament from time to time. The scheduled castes order of 1950 issued under the provision provided the first list of the scheduled castes but made the list religion specific. Initially, the 1950 order restricted the scheduled caste to the Hindu religion. Although the castes included in the net were shared by various other communities. Later, Sikhs and Buddhists were also included by amendments introduced in 1956 and 1990 respectively. All other religious communities including mainly the Christians and the Muslims who share many vocation based castes with the Hindus hitherto remain outside the scheduled caste net. Since as a local custom of general prevalence, the caste system is found in fashion also among the Christians and the Muslims demands have been made by these communities from time to time for the removal of the religion related proviso from the scheduled caste order of 1950 so that the lower castes among them may also be included in the scheduled castes net and benefit from the special measures introduced for them. They have had recourse to the courts also for this relief but the courts have not agreed to it due to the egalitarian nature of Christianity and Islam in their Puritan form. You see, if a Hindu Sikh or Buddhist scheduled caste person converts to any other faith, he ceases to remain in the scheduled caste net and loses all the benefits extended to scheduled castes. However, such a person may reconvert to Hinduism and will thereupon regain all those lost benefits. Such effects of conversion and reconversion by members of the scheduled castes have has been affirmed in several judicial decisions. Conversion by a scheduled caste person to Christianity or Islam would also take him out of the ambit of a law enacted by the parliament for the protection of scheduled castes from social 
atrocities of various kinds. Now, coming to the scheduled tribes, you see in terms of the provisions of the constitution relating to the scheduled tribes, a scheduled tribes order was issued in 1951. Unlike the scheduled castes order of 1950, this order is not religion specific. It could not be so since the tribal groups in various parts of India profess different religions, either one of the established religions or a local indigenous religion. There are numerous Christians and Muslims among the scheduled tribes. The other backward classes of the OBC group is also not religion specific. Many lower castes and backward sections of various religious faiths not rent a place in the scheduled caste order of 1950 and have been accommodated in the OBC group. If we are to address the question of who are religious minorities, then it becomes important to note here that the constitution of India uses the expression minorities whether based on religion or those based on language. Unfortunately, this does not specify who are to be regarded as minorities on religion. Both the National Commission for Minorities Act of 1992 and the National Commission for Minority Educational Institutions Act of 2004 say that the term minority occurring in their provisions would mean the religious communities notified as such by the central government. The National Commission for Minorities Act of 1992 listed the Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists and Parsi, Joro, Austrians to be the minorities for the purposes of that act. Note that the notification issued by the central government in 1993 under the National Commission for Minorities Act of 1992 remains silent about the minority status of the Jains. The community has been making a case for it in the National Minorities Commission which has repeatedly recommended minority status for it. As no action was taken on this recommendation, some leaders of the community went to the court, but the Supreme Court did not accept the claim. However, in a later case, the Supreme Court affirmed the validity of a UP government notification, recognizing the Jains as a minority in that state. The Local Minorities Commission acts either provides that minorities in the concerned states would mean the religious communities notified as such by the central government or empower the state government concerned to notify the minorities. Under both these kinds of provisions in the Local Minorities Commission acts, the Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists and Persis are recognized as religious minorities in all those states where such acts are in force. The Representation of the People Act of 1951 prohibits among many other things the use of religion and religious symbols with a view to promote an aspirance candidacy for a public election or for adversely affecting the election of another such candidate. The act empowers the high courts to declare the election of a winning candidate to be void if he commits inter alia a corrupt practice. Besides promoting or attempting to promote feelings of enmity or hatred between classes in connection with an election on the grounds of religion, race, caste, community or language is declared by the act 
to be an offence punishable with imprisonment up to three years, fine or both. In conclusion, I would like to say that the constitution of India and other laws and policies indeed protect religious freedom and in practice the government generally respected religious freedom. However, some state level laws and policies restricted this freedom. We all know that India is a secular republic with all religions being offered equality under the law. It is the birthplace of several religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and Sikhism and home for thousands of years to Jews, Zoroastrians, Muslim and Christian communities. The vast majority of citizens of all religious groups lived in peaceful coexistence and were conscious of religious freedom and minority rights. However, at times violence between religious groups broke out and there were instances of organized communal attacks against religious minorities. The country's democratic system, open society, independent legal institutions, vibrant civil society and free press actively provided mechanisms to address violations of religious freedom as and when they occurred. With this we come to an end of the discussion of the module entitled Religion and Law, a Correlation. We will meet again in some other discussion on some other topic. Thank you.